Righteousness that saves. Is there actually a righteousness that saves? That's the thing. That's the only thing that we're going to look at today. Spoiler alert. There's a righteousness that saves and must come from Christ. It must come from a closer walk with our Savior. But there's also a righteousness that deceives our hearts. Deceives us and leads us right on the pathway to hell. It's a righteousness that pardons, not a righteousness that is righteous. It's a righteousness that condemns, not a righteousness that condemns. It's a righteousness that leads to legalism, not a righteousness that leads to salvation. This morning, we're going to look at some of our swaps in Scripture. I hope you can trust your Bible friend to find it. We're going to take up the entirety of Romans 10. We're going to dissect those several. We're going to spend some time in Ecclesiastes for the time to come. We'll talk about Matthew when I get back into Romans. So I hope you're ready. Would you please rise with me as we read the passage God has laid on my heart to share with you today? Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 1, we're going to read all the way to 21 today. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for those of us that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. As we saw in the video, for they would be ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not committed themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. For Moses describes the law, which was the law that the man would judge these things that were Christ. But the righteousness which is the state of speaking of time, this life. Say not in my heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead? For what say of him? The word is not in you, even my mouth and my heart, that is the word of faith, which we preach. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus Christ, and shall believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on his name in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without the preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they are not all to obey the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I said, have they not heard? Yes, verily, the sound went to all the earth, and their words unto the ends of the world. But I did say, but God said, did not Israel know? First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are 
no people, and by foolish things that I wasn't very good. So the guy opened the very door and said, I was found of them that saw me not. I was made manifest unto them that I saw not them. But to Israel, he said, All day long I stretched forth my hand to a vessel of meat and gave them to you. But it's part of the Father, thank you for another Sunday that we can spend and spend with you as well. Thank you that you give us the very breath that we breathe and give us the ability to sing your praises and to proclaim your name and your love and your justice. Prepare our hearts to hear the words that you've given us. I pray that you would make this to a place that the congregation could listen to hear the words that you've given us. And Father, for those that need to return to you, I pray that you would give them that desire. And Father, for those that are resting securely, I pray that you give them comfort and rest in the way that I am. And Father, above all, I pray that you give us the boldness to proclaim your name, to preach your gospel of peace. I pray all these things in the name of our mighty Savior, in Jesus' name. As I studied on this, as I thought about this, I was reminded of a passage in Isaiah. So let's look at it real quick. It's Isaiah 64 and verse 6. But we are all unclean things, and our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. In the Hebrew, the idiom of the filthy rags is like menstrual rags. To be frank. I had thought about going to a bookstore, soaking some ketchup in vinegar, and asking who wants some of my righteousness. But then I thought I would have to be the guy with those things on the conveyor belt going to the cashier and going, oh, thank you so much. But what a picture that gives us. No matter how hard we work, no matter how good we think we are, no matter how many Sundays we we stand here in the pew and sing out to God how meaningless that actually is unless you have His righteousness, unless you're doing it for His glory, unless you're doing it filled with His Spirit. Because if we do it on our own, it means nothing. Our righteousness is disgusting, is it not? is what pushes Christ down the cross. So it's been used in times past, this, this phrase to the lay of the the lay of the fear, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And that's been used to say, I stand at the door, Jesus is standing at the door of your heart, asking you to open it up. That's not really what he's saying there. He's been pushed outside of the church. He's knocking on the door to his church, to who is supposed to be his people. But it's our righteousness, our self-righteousness, that puts him out the church. It's 
said, God, you don't belong in here. Jesus, this is my body, it's not yours. What does Jesus say about that church? You think you're rich, but you're poor. You think you've got clothes on. You think you dress fancy, but you're naked. You're desperate. You think you have houses, but you're homeless. See, everything you think you are, because you did it. And so this school this morning, we talked about our faith being saved. But I tell you, your faith can only be saved if you're the one that built it. If you build the sword of truth, it will break the first battle. Is your sword built by God, or is our sword built by ourselves? Is our breastplate of truth built by ourselves? Is our shield built by what we think it is? Because everything that we have to offer up to God is utterly, totally vital. Disgusting. Let's take it a step further. Why did Isaiah use the idiom of menstrual rags for his description of how a righteousness? He goes back to the law. During that week, that that thing happened, the women were declared unclean. They were sent outside the camp to collect. If they needed to engage in commerce, they had their side of the street they would have to walk on and yell out, unclean, unclean, so that everybody would know to avoid them, that they were not to be engaged with, were not to be touched, were not to be interacted at all interacted with, that they were to be avoided just like the lepers, just like those with open sores that did not heal, and all of the other ailments that one was considered unclean for. Our righteousness no better than walking down that side of the street. We should be yelling, unclean, unclean. And if I try to make myself righteous on my own, if we try to do it on our own, if we try to make this church righteous by our works, by our doings, it is no better than those menstrual rags, and we're actually unclean. We're unworthy vessels that are pushing Christ out the door. This is supposed to be the righteousness of faith. See, the righteousness that God expects is pure. The righteousness that God expects is pure. See, this is the contrast between King and Lord and God. That the sacrifice that Abel offered up by Canada is an acceptance. Because he didn't stop it. He called God's law. Cancer. God, you're going to do it my way because this is my way, and I said, I'm going to do it. And it was counted for him as unrighteousness. How can I see the good in this person? God, why are you using them but not me? God, why are you using that church and not this church? Is it because our righteousness is of our own? Or is it because we're walking in his righteousness? See, Jesus says it this way in Matthew. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. So what is the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes? The Jewish tradition is 460 plus laws. And they would live each law on the outside. You could look at them and go, that is the way to be. But on the inside, you're like what? You look at on the outside, but you're dead inside. You're not seeing the righteousness you can see. We saw that in our text today. That the Jews thought themselves to be righteous and didn't need the righteousness of God. Is that where we are as Christians today? That we think we have the righteousness of the peace all worked out. That we have our lives all together. But are we just like what? 
See, what, is, what would Jesus say out there? They walk through, you know, the first it says, don't commit murder. But if you have hatred towards your brother in your heart, you committed murder. If you look at upon a woman with lust in your heart, you commit adultery. You walk through the Ten Commandments. And I've heard it said that because Jesus reiterated the Ten Commandments in the New Covenant, that is why we follow the, the, the Ten Commandments and nothing else but the law. But I think that that's wrong. I think that's erroneous. And here's what I think of it. Because I got this thing, so it's abomination to do it on. It's abomination to do it. The laws that Jesus said were set up to show us righteousness. Don't say it. So what he's driving at is what's going on in your heart. See, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees and the scribes, you don't you have to keep all 460 plus laws in your actions, in your mind, in your thoughts, in your words, and the meditations of your heart. He's capable of doing it. The only one. That's why his righteousness is pure. He came down, was born of a virgin, fully God, fully man, was tempted like you are tempted, was tried like you are tried, to walk through it and went to the cross to the land without blemish or spot. He was crucified to pay our debt. So that way we could raise up our filthy rags and go, God, take this from me. And he says, it's mine. It's mine. Here's, here's my word. Here's my righteousness in its place. See, he wants those filthy rags, and he's the only one that does. When's the last time we took our filthy rags to him and said, Here it is now? And there is therefore no condemnation for those that does it. You know, there's. For those that profess that you are a child of God, you take your filthy rags, you drop it at his feet, and there's no blood stain on your garment. You washed it white as snow. Have you been washed in the blood? You see, he exchanges our blood, which is vile, disgusting, and dirty, and gives us his blood, which is pure, clean, and saving. And he brings us to the righteousness that saves his soul. Because he wants to spend the rest of eternity with you. How great is our God? How awesome is our God that he wants to do that for us, even though we could never measure up? Even though what we say and what we do is totally and consistently against him. We read that the, the heart and the desires of man in Genesis 5 and 6 is totally and completely evil, not capable of any kind of good. So even the things that we say are done in the name of Christ, if they're done in my flesh, they're not good. They're not even capable of good, even though on the outside it might seem like they're good. But Jesus, being fully God and fully man, had a relationship with him, never separated from the Father, except for one time. When our sins were thrust upon Christ as he hung on the cross and he cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That was the cry of his humanity because through that moment, Jesus experienced for the first time what we experience on a daily basis. And that is our sin that separates us from a relationship with our Father. He switched to God. He proclaimed, the color side, paid in full, it is finished. He paid the debt, all so that he could give us his righteousness as a free gift to all that call upon the name of the Lord. Here's the thing. If you've got to make that, if you've got to sit weird, with some today, I promise you that. But you must first believe in your heart and then confess with your mouth. There's an order there. See, if you speak to the head, the heart may never arise. But if you believe in your heart, the heart will change the head. So where are you at in your heart today? Is your heart in tune with the heart of the Savior? 
I, I can envision a pudding fork. It's for those of you that are just like funny. You hit one side of the pudding fork and it resonates, and you can tell if something's into an attitude based off of that resonation. If you were to punch your heart, what is resonating? Or would it sound like out of tune? Would it sound disjointed? Would it be like a cat that's running out of noise? And not be a good thing. Isn't that what I like to think about in bed? So the world is set in every good thing. See, we have the benefit of Paul's whole section of Corinthians. He adds to the bridge, he's referring back to things that were written in the past. I'm going to take a moment here and say we often think about the Old Testament and the New Testament on one of us semester. And it's also said that the uh, New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And that's true. But how often we think of it like a woven fabric. Because we have the New Testament and the Old Testament, but you got to look for it. We have the Old Testament and the New Testament, but you got to look for it. But together they make one complete whole. One of the one you can't stand. You can't stand it. One requires the other. The Old Testament without the New Testament gives us the law. The New Testament without the Old Testament doesn't give us the answer. Let's continue on in Romans chapter 10 here. Verse, chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That's found in Ecclesiastes 7, 20. Let's look at that real quick. There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and standeth not. There's not a just man upon the earth that can do that good, that's no respectful person to all the time. We're getting back to Romans 4. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. We are all gone out of the way. They together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. So that, let's look back at Psalms. And the 14th chapter. 51 through 3. Fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable work. There is none that do it good. The Lord looked down from heaven on the children of men to see if there were any that did not understand and seek God. Here's the truth. They are all gone together. They are all together become filthy. There is none that do it good. Is an open sepulchre. With their tongues, they have used deceit to poison it. The poison of the axe is under their lips. Psalms 5 9. Let's really sound that one out. For there is no faithfulness to man. Their inward parts. 
they break into an open separate way. And they splatter with their tongue. The point that Paul was making in Romans with the act, so the serpent, the poison with a poison tongue, and you're poisoning with it. It's a poison serpent. Or it's poison that way. That's what it is. Sharper than tongue, like a serpent, and it's poison. It's under the tongue. Now back to the story. His mouth is full of twisting and bitterness. So this song says that. Mouth is full of twisting and deceit and fraud under his tongue. There's mystery and bad speech. There's no bad describing of what the king does. That's the end of Romans 3 16. Yes, but then their feet are swift to shed blood. That's the end of 59 7 and 8. And the way of peace they have not known. Verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Psalm 36 1, so I'll just put that one. Transgression of the wicked is within my heart, but there is no fear of God before his eyes. For he flattereth himself in his own eyes, and so the wicked iniquity be found to be his sin. The words of his mouth are the poison of his speech. He hath let that to be wise and to be good. He devises a mischief for part of his way. He set him to himself, himself in a way that is not good. He abhors that evil. He's trying to tolerate the evil. I tolerate the evil. Are there things that's going on in here? That's the reason. How Paul and Saul do those things going on inside the cinema and music and all of these entertainment things. And how bold are those confessing Christ, seeking Christ. Preaching Christ's presence in those places that are full of deceit, full of envy, full of strife. And do we just accept it? Do I just wait for the good? I know where I'm going, but they can all fit me in on something. Isn't that part of self righteousness? I was reminded of a story again in Sunday school. I was a kid at my school, Southern Baptist Church. It's shocking. <laughs> there were these two kids that were part of part of youth group, but they didn't dress like us. They didn't act like us. They didn't talk like us. They had chains with their wallets going down to the floor. They had spikes in their hair, and they dressed with all kinds of weird things. But one Sunday morning. They came and stepped forward, the teacher did, and also the pastor. And they stepped forward to give their life to Christ. On the way out, they were met by a teacher. Well, now that you're saved, you've got to cut your hair, you've got to dress this way, you can't talk like that, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to mold to our rules. I've never seen those kids again. The 
Are we sending the word out from this place, or are we hiding the word to ourselves, keeping it for ourselves, hoarding our salvation to ourselves? So you're saying, boy, you're doing with it. That's what the book is all about. So how many people have really healed out of these things? We've been all been told to share the gospel. To go and make disciples of all nations. You've been called to be God's mouthpiece. You've been called to be God's workman. What are you doing with your salvation, with the gifts and the talents that God has given each one of us that is unique to each and every one of us so that we can further His kingdom, not further my kingdom? So we can further the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of Chris Southern. And here we get to the Did not Israel know? First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. This phenomenon by a foolish nation is then great to God. But Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that act not after me. What he's saying there is, those that I tried to reach, I couldn't reach. But those that God called found me. Do you see that in verse 21? But to Israel, he says, All day long I have stretched forth my hand to a disobedient and gainsaying people. I have stretched out the hand to the gospel of peace, and they've rejected me. And in fact, they've rejected God. But those that I have not been out to seek have still found me. Are we out looking? Are we expecting them to come to us? The analogy of the farmer running his harvest field all year long and then wondering why God's not giving him a crop. And then the question is, he has a more, he has a bit of the soil. He hasn't allowed the time for the seeds to grow to then be harvested. It takes time, it takes us, it takes energy. Ask any farmer, they're going to tell you. And the same thing is true with our salvation with Christ. We can be a mouthpiece to God's church for us. That's the way it's going to Are we out there generating relationships, intentionally engaging those that are lost, so we can plant some seeds and water some soil, and hopefully maybe see the harvest? But just because we planted the seed and water, it doesn't mean that we're going to harvest it. It means for somebody else to harvest it. Come on, for God's sake, I'll be God's way. But our righteousness, that faith, must be God's righteousness. And isn't it awesome that He gives us this choice? Isn't it awesome you, you say, God, empty me of myself and fill me up with you, and guess what? He comes with you. Not by words, so that no man may boast, but by the, by the, by the faith of our heart, of our power, almighty faith, sorry, the words are today. As we close this morning, I want you to reflect on this. Do we have the righteousness of ourselves? Or are we full of the righteousness of Christ? Are we full of the hate? And the poison that seeks to kill off the crop that God has. Or is our righteousness leading into salvation? Is our righteousness full of love and kindness? Is our righteousness full of boldness that brings people to Christ? Christ, that Jesus Christ is Messiah and King of the world. How do you believe with your heart, not just with your mind? Thank you.
pray that you can still be a voice in our life. I pray, Father, that you can reveal to us what needs to be in the future. Father, let us go to the future of the Father, fill us with you. Empty us of ourselves and fill us with your Holy Spirit. Give us your righteousness that we can never have. Give us the righteousness that we can never attain on our own. Give us the righteousness that we could not be the way that ground works for us. Our own words. Father, give us your spirit. Help us to be a loving people, loving of one another. Essentially, bold enough to proclaim your word and your truth in the midst of us. Father, I pray that you remove the tears of poison from the congregation, from our lives. Father, give us your spirit. Father, help us to love the community around us like you love them. Give us eyes like you have to see those that are hurting, those that need you, and to make an introduction between you and them. Father, help us to see people the way you see people. Help us to see our neighbors the way you see our neighbors. Help us, Father, to carry one another's burdens with love. And graciousness and kindness. Father, we thank you for another day of grace. 